evening, Mr. and Ms. Internet and all our ships at sea. <clears throat> oh, a little crack right there. Anyway, this is the world famous Freeway Forum coming to you live and direct from the world famous 405 Freeway in beautiful sunny Southern California. My name is Tari. I'll be your host for however long this takes to get off the freeway. A lot of legendary traffic here in Southern California. It's usually not terrible. It's about, about 20 to 30 minutes usually. Anyway, we're going to discuss the top stories and whatever happens across my mind today. A little bit of commentary. This is a show driven partly by me, partly by you. This is a show where we exchange ideas. And uh, we come together and we come to an understanding and we bounce ideas off of each other. And hopefully we're all the better for it. As you see, it is nice and sunny here. Uh, it's uh, right about, uh, right about 80 something degrees, low 80s right now in Southern California, the metropolitan Los Angeles area. Far cry from what's going on on the Northeast coast of the United States. A uh, big blizzard headed that way. Hunker down guys, stay warm. Anyway, so here we are once again. So good news, good news out of the uh, <clears throat> good news out of the uh, elections, the Federal Elections Commission. Uh, it turns out the FEC is not going to appeal the decision uh, that declared them improper uh, in dealing with the uh, the commission on the presidential debates. I mean, they have to come, they have, what, 30 days to come up with new rules, or less than that, I think, actually, to come up with new rules uh, for the uh, Commission on Presidential Debates in order to make them more fair uh, to the other voices that are inside the debates. Essentially, I think what it's going to come down to is uh, because, you know, the arbitrary number was 15%, you know, if you were polling at 15% nationally, then you could be invited for the, the big debates. But it's a matter of exposure. Without without polling 15%, you're not going to be on the debate stage. But without being on the debate stage, nobody's going to consider you a viable candidate. Thus, you're not going to get the 15% polling. It's sort of a chicken and egg problem that, uh, that the uh, uh, debates commission uh, came up with after the, what was it, the 92 debates with... Uh, Bush and Perot and Clinton. Oh, that third voice in there throwing a monkey wrench in everything. But that's that's what America's about. We need to have that third voice. We need to have the third, fourth, fifth voice. I want more voices in the debates. Damn it. I want more voices. I want people to be heard. I want more opinions than just the duopoly. Uh, anyway, and so that's what the... Uh, that's what hopefully we will see in the 2020 debates uh, when the FEC releases new rules for the Commission on Presidential Debates. Hopefully we'll see the Libertarians get in there. Hopefully we'll see the Greens get in there. Maybe even the Justice Democrats. Such a funny name, Justice Democrats. Justice Democrats. Meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice Democrats. Anyway, so... Um, so, yeah, so we've got this, uh, basically what I'm seeing happening, hopefully this is what happened, is that you will see, uh, you'll see new rules enacted uh, that if a candidate has a mathematical, like, from being on the ballot in so many states, has a mathematical uh, chance of winning the election, then they will be on the debate stage. It's ridiculous that candidates who were on the ballot in all 50 states, well, a candidate who was on the ballot in all 50 states, would not be invited for the debates, would not be included in the debates. And Gary Johnson is a libertarian candidate, Johnson and Weld on that ticket. Uh, they were not included in the debates for whatever reason. Because the other two parties are scared of competition. The Republicans are scared of the Libertarians. The Democrats are scared of the Greens. Yeah. There's a lot 
lot more voices in this country, and there's a lot more voices that need to be heard. That's, that's democracy. That's how this works. Anyway, so uh, so hopefully that's what we're going to see uh, in the next uh, the next debate cycle, in the next election cycle. We're going to see more voices heard. Uh, we're going to see more voices on the debate stage. We're going to see more arguments, more throwing it back and forth. And it's going to be fun. It's going to be entertaining. I I look forward to that. And maybe it won't be. Maybe, you know, maybe it'll be. You have to be on all fifty ballots. Maybe that'll be the rule. It probably won't be something as nice as uh, as a mathematical mathematical shot at the presidency, which is what Jill Stein had. She had a mathematical shot, but not a practical shot. Uh, Johnson well more or less had a, a practical shot because they were on all fifty ballots. So we'll see what happens. Uh, we will see. Meanwhile, in the wild, wild world of politics, uh, coming coming off yet another uh, idiot week in Washington, uh, the, the White House is proposing rules to uh, a couple of different things here. One, it's proposing rules that say that ISPs do not have to explicitly get your permission in order to share your personal data with marketers or whomever they decide. Uh, that sits very poorly with me as I'm a, I'm a person who wants to control my own data. It's sort of why I joined the Indie Web, uh, why I hold that mentality. I like to control my own, uh, I like to control my appearances, I like to control my image. I want to control all that stuff outside of Facebook. I want to control it outside of Twitter. Now, I, I have relinquished some level of that kind of control. And by and large, what I'm doing now is, you know, I've pushed myself more, you know, I am posting more directly with Twitter, with Facebook, but a lot of what I'm posting is, um, you know, I'm posting some, you know, goofy photos, things like that. I, I'm posting things that, you know, I have a level of publicity to. That's sort of what I'm going with. You know, I'll have conversations on Twitter that don't necessarily be, you know, aren't necessarily things that have to be back on my website, have to be back on your airportsover.com. Yeah, I understand that. I understand the level of, uh, of practicality here. And so I'm beginning to see that more. I'm beginning to do that in my, uh, my dealings on social media. So coming back, I'm being more social, so to speak, on social media, uh, engaging in conversations and posting things. Uh, also, you know, it's it's kind of impractical to post. It's kind of impractical to post things that I did not create on my website for a variety of reasons. One, there is the licensing thing, and you know, repurposing someone else's content in order to generate your own traffic. Yeah, there's an ethical quandary there. Yes, I understand. Uh, but. Uh, as a practical matter, it is, it's just, it's gotten so big, like, it's gotten to the point where, you know, just posting a repost is just not, you know, it doesn't work out so well uh, with social media, it doesn't work out. But my thoughts, I'll post there, of course, I'll, I'll post my thoughts. If it contains a link, you know, that it contains a link, yeah. So, it's been a learning process. It's been a learning process, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work. And I think I've got it, uh, got it narrowed down now to what is going to be working. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, always looking for a conversation at AirborneSurfer.com or on the Twitter at AirborneSurfer. So that's that's one of the things that I am uh, watching right now is this this whole idea that um, making it to where the ISPs do not have to they do not have to get your explicit permission to share your data. 
which to me just rings. At the same time, uh, there's speaking of personal data and not sharing it, uh, there's another one going through where it's uh, lifting uh, legal protections that say you don't have to. You know, right now, we have legal we have legal protections to that say that we don't have to disclose uh, genetic predis genetic predispositions. Genetic predispositions. I can actually say it. Right. Uh, we don't have to do that. A, we don't have to go through it. Uh, we don't have to go through such testing, and B, we don't have to disclose it to our employers if we do. Uh, but there is a new bill being considered uh, that would make it easier uh, or essentially eliminate such protections that would make it easier for companies to compel you to give up your data. Which is completely bass backwards and should not even be debated on the floor at this point. talking about you're talking about opening the floodgates for genetic discrimination you're opening the floodgates for uh, people for companies to say well you know, we don't want to insure you we don't want to hire you because you might have work days you might miss work days because of some disease that you may or may not get Basically, we're just winding back uh, the ADA and HIPAA and, and all these sort of uh, you know, these protectionist sort of uh, personal protections sort of regulations. That yeah, there's a lot. There are a lot of regulations there. Yeah, and it's it's burdensome in some cases, but they exist for a very good reason. HIPAA exists for a very good reason. It is. It's burdensome, yes. It makes it more difficult to do paperwork. It makes it more difficult to do. Uh, it makes it more difficult to exchange information, especially between other uh, other healthcare providers, and of course, uh, uh, payment uh, payment systems. But it you know, certain things. Well, it, it can, but you can't be sued for it. That's what. It, that's what it is. It will show up on a credit report. It can't show up on a credit report. It can, it can wreck your credit, but you can't be sued for it. You can't get a judgment against you. It's different. In a practical matter, it doesn't yeah, It's one of those things. Not that I advocate people just skipping out of their bills, um, but this circles back to uh, a whole issue of healthcare and paying for healthcare and providing healthcare doing it in a way that is economically feasible. There should be more competition in the marketplace. There absolutely should be more competition in the marketplace. We're talking about simply enabling a provider to collect on debts. And yes, they have a right to be able to collect on debt if you skip on it. Sure, absolutely. However, because of the way their systems are set up, uh, it is more detrimental to the consumer to have their information floating around out there in an unprotected format, attached to a security number, um, which demonstrably causes an increased level of identity theft, an increased risk of identity theft, demonstrably proves it. versus you know, not having it out there and the, uh, the case for uh, you know, attaching a social security number for financial reasons. Uh, so, lesson learned, never, never disclose your social security number to a medical provider. You either do not use or just fill in the numbers as willy-nilly. It's not like they're really going to be able to check. I also prefer not to use a social security card for, for your, what is 
it's an I-9, uh, just make sure that you're a legal, legal citizen that's uh, legally able to work in the United States. Don't use a social security number for that. Uh, use a passport, use something that's not a social security number. Maybe use a passport, you don't have to give me your driver's license either. I mean, the passport carries with it its own level of identity issues, security issues, but it's less readily accessible for the purposes of identity theft. Uh, it's harder to do identity theft with a passport than it is to do with a security number because the, the passport is not as prolific uh, an identifier. single-payer system is far more, uh, single-payer system is far more efficient, may not be the best word, but it's far more consumer-friendly. Yeah. It's a single-payer system. You simply just go in, and you get the work done, and you leave. Done. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what you're doing uh, or where you're going you, you walk in you get the thing taken care of and you, and you walk out um, versus something like insurance insurance should not be called insurance anyway because insurance is not insurance it's just a payment system it's a payment plan is what it is you pay into it and um, it's not really an insurance issue because you're going to need some level of health care anyway um, it's an inevitability, not a uh, not something that you would insure against. Uh, but uh, yeah, we call it insurance for various reasons. But long and short is that insurance is a payment system. Healthcare insurance, health insurance is not an insurance. It is a method of paying for healthcare. And there are several things at play here. One, with healthcare, you know, there's a culture in this country that healthcare is uh, rather opaque. It is not transparent. The policies are not transparent. Uh, people go into it. It, there, it is a, it is an industry, uh, an industry of. Oh, hey, me, I'm tired, man. Daylight saving kicks your ass. Um, anyway, uh, healthcare is a um, healthcare is an industry of it, it's an industry that thrives on the few having this level of esoteric knowledge uh, that the many don't necessarily have, and thus, you know, for one, you you have a, a highly educated service provider and a relatively uneducated uh, service uh, recipient. So there's there's an equity there that has to be resolved at some level. Which is, you know, I hear a lot about uh, I hear a lot about parents demanding antibiotics for a child that has a viral infection. Uh, antibiotics aren't going to do anything for a viral infection. That's, they're antibiotics, not antiviral or virucides or whatever you want to call them. But, uh, but there are parents that demand it because they don't understand. Uh, you can't give a kid amoxicillin for a cold. It just isn't going to work. And it's going to lead to antibiotic resistance. But... Uh, situation where you have this esoteric knowledge, you have this inequity of, uh, of knowledge, and then you have, uh, on the other hand, along with that, you have uh, a very expensive, you have a very expensive uh, service 
Costa. Uh, much like the cell phone industry in the United States, much like the wireless industry and wireless communication in the United States, for a very long time, people did not understand the cost of a cell phone. They thought that cell phones cost you know, $25, $50 if it was expensive, $100 if it was really expensive. They didn't understand that you know, phones cost like six, seven hundred bucks. Uh, they're computers. They're little tiny computers that you put in your pocket, but they were so heavily subsidized by the wireless industry, the carrier industry. But people just got used to getting a free phone with a service. And now that there's true competition in the field, now that everything has been busted up, thanks T-Mobile uh, for you know, doing something right. Now that there is true competition in the wireless field, you know, and there were some growing pains, there was some adjustment there, and people needed to uh, learn. People had to learn that, you know, what the true cost of a phone was. Uh, and then they started to learn what the true cost of a plan was, too. Uh, so now wireless, uh, wireless services in the United States have settled, kind of settled, right around $50. inclusive plan. Uh, there's been a little bit of a price war lately um, and that's where the market's kind of settled for now. So, but, you know, healthcare, healthcare is one of these things. You know, what is it, you know, how much does it cost for stitches? And I, you know, that's a relevant story to me because I had to get stitches a few months ago. Um, cut my hand open and had to get stitches and I made a phone call. I called the clinic and I said, how much does it cost? I need to know because I'm not paying well. Okay, so my system, I'm set up on the HTH high deductible which is the lowest upfront cost out of my paycheck. Uh, it's the lowest premiums, if you want to call them premiums, but it, it is the, the lowest premium there. Now, it doesn't have the bells and the whistles. It doesn't cover, you know, everything, you know, it doesn't cover 100% of the cost of everything. Uh, what it does is basically buys me into a network of care providers. It buys me into a network of care providers, and it buys me um, preventative care, you know, basic preventative type of care. That's all covered. Everything above and beyond that is out of pocket. But the nice thing is, the compromise is that now I have an HSA, a health savings plan, a health savings account that I can put money into. I can sock money away into it. There's no limit on it. It's a it's pre-tax money. So it gives me a, it's tax advantaged. It gives me a position to be in <clears throat> tax-wise because if I need to lower my tax liability for a year, I can do that. That's just what it's intended to do. Um, and, you know, at retirement it becomes a source of uh, tax-deferred income. Uh, it's, it's a retirement plan. But if I, uh, you know, I need to go to the dentist or I need to get stitches or whatever, if I have any kind of health care costs, they're paid for, you know, glasses, whatever. Uh, they're paid for out of the HSA. I don't necessarily need vision coverage, vision insurance, because that's a commodity. Uh, dental insurance, dental coverage is a commodity. I just go in and I pay for dental service. I don't need to have this, uh, this prepaid type sort of plan.
money is still yours uh, because it's a way to save for retirement. And then, of course, if you need to use it, it is spent tax-free uh, out of the HSA for health. So it's nice to have. And, you know, I can't really go much further into it simply because I just don't have time. Uh, but needless to say, you know, between single-payer and the HDHP, uh, you know, I could go either way with it. I understand why single-payer is appealing. I understand why the HDHP is appealing. Um, I like opening up the marketplace. I like the idea of keeping the marketplace open so that uh, we have more competition and we can bring prices down. But the takeaway here is that if we as a culture, if we as a society get into a culture, adopt a culture of asking how much it costs for something, uh, negotiating prices, you know, talking about things, you know, uh, figuring out um, how much Basically, let's break down this curtain. Let's break down this this opacity uh, to healthcare and to the costs, and we're going to have a better time, regardless if it's single payer or regardless if it is uh, something more akin to what we had prior to the ACA. But I'm out of time. I'm out of time here. I'm off the freeway, so. Uh, you know, follow along in the conversation. Let's continue the conversation on Twitter at Airborne Surfer. And of course, uh, you can uh, leave comments in the doobly doo, as this will be on YouTube at youtube.com slash the Airborne Surfer. Um, and of course, there's always uh, lots of fun and interesting stuff over at Airborne Surfer.com. So, uh, Airborne, at Airborne Surfer on Twitter, youtube.com slash the Airborne Surfer. And, of course, airbornesurfer.com. Uh, I'll see you guys over there. Thanks for joining me on another Freeway Forum. I'll see you guys next time. And until then, tally-ho, y'all.